Right. So I'll be uh, talking about scanning electron microscopy. And this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So first, uh, I'll give you a brief uh, idea about the applications of scanning electron microscopy. Then we'll discuss some differences between transmission and scanning electron microscopy. Then we'll come to the components of a SEM and their functions. Then we'll come to biological specimen preparation techniques. Then we'll discuss some imaging conditions and parameters, how to operate, uh, what to keep in mind while uh, operating the SEM. Then we'll discuss some artifacts and some imaging problems that uh, one comes about while operating the SEM. And some practical applications and some publications. And then finally, we'll I'll, uh, maybe spend one or two slides on some cutting edge advancements and their applications. Okay, so coming to the applications of scanning electron microscopy, there are various applications. As you can see here, development of, uh, I hope you can see the cursor, my mouse pointer. Uh, so development of novel nanobiomaterials, understanding the mode of action of drugs, characterization of drug delivery systems. Uh, it has applications in medical diagnostics, in pathology, uh, which most of you, all of you here are uh, interested in. Then in microbiology, investigating bacteria and viruses and the interactions with surfaces, antimicrobials. Then how cells function and respond to disease and stress. In, it has applications in cell and molecular biology, in structural biology in a big way, as we'll see in the cutting edge, uh, cutting edge advancements. And it has also applications uh, in forensic science as well. And other than these, uh, SEM has a lot of applications in nanotechnology and material sciences, where high resolution imaging is required for preventing material failure in industries like aerospace, electronics, and energy. And it's also useful for development of innovative materials, like uh, maybe in dentistry, and where they use a lot of uh, materials that are used for implant materials and things like that. So these wide, these are some of the uh, applications of scanning electron microscopy. Where they're used. So what is an electron microscope has been discussed by Dr. Agrawal in quite some detail. So just to give you uh, be a, some of the slides may be common for both our classes. So what an electron microscope basically does is it offers very high resolution. So for a TEM, it would be like two angstroms. And for an ACM, it's 10 times worse, typically, like it's two nanometers. And it offers very high magnification, like more than a million times and it employs a beam of accelerated electrons instead of light, as you have in light microscope. And the other major difference is instead of using glass lenses here in electron microscopes, we have electromagnetic lenses. And uh, the reason why such high resolution is achievable is because of the wavelength of electrons. It has very small wavelength, light at 60 kV, it's like 0 0.005 nanometers. So here, uh, we have a comparison of the resolving power of the human eye, which is 0.2 millimeters. So you can resolve things, objects, 0.2 mill at the resolution of 0.2 millimeters for the human eye. For a light microscope, it's 0.2 micrometers. For a transmission electron microscope, it's 0.2 nanometers, which is like two angstroms. And for a ACM, it's two nanometers. Typically, the best ACM uh, would give you a resolution of two nanometers. So here, today's class, we are concerned about scanning electron microscopy. So again, this uh, slide here shows you the uh, range of objects that can be seen with a, with, an human, with a human eye, with the light microscope, and with electron microscopes. So it's very important to keep, uh, keep in mind the uh, dimensions of objects that you are resolving. So basically, it's in the nanoscale. So one nanometer would be 10 to the power of minus 9 meters. And here 0.1 nanometer is like one angstrom, which is 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. So you can easily see what objects are resolvable using the eye, the light microscope, and the electron microscopes. So here, in a typical, uh, very high resolution, uh, modern transmission electron microscope, you'll be even be able to resolve atoms. Okay, so uh, microscopes, again, uh, since this is the microscopy course, I thought maybe we can categorize all kinds of microscopes under these three categories here. 
you have an optical microscope, you can have a charged particle microscope, and you can have a scanning probe microscope. So optical microscope is something which all of you must have used. So this is uh, basically uses light and transparent glass lenses. And a charged particle microscope, we use electrons or ions. So here typically in today's class, talking about electron microscopy. So here the charged particle, the source is electrons. And instead of, uh, instead of glass lenses, to electrons, uh, using electrons here. So we use electromagnetic lenses to focus these particles. And in the third category, we have a scanning probe microscope, which uses a physical probe, which is basically, again, a very small, sharp needle, which scans the sample in contact or near contact the surface of the specimen. So what it basically does is maps various forces and interactions that occur between the probe and the sample. So typically this is example would be an atomic force microscope or a scanning tunneling microscope. So a scanning tunneling microscope is not the same as a scanning electron microscope, okay? Okay, so here on the top row, you see the optical microscopes. It's an upright microscope. It's an invert, inverted microscope, and you have a stereo microscope. And here, this is our uh, transmission electron microscope here, and this is our scanning electron microscope. And the last one here is the scanning tunneling microscope or atomic force microscope, also called the scanning probe microscope. So basically, these are the wide, uh, you can categorize them under these three categories. So what type of in, types of electron microscopes are there and what kind of information do we get out of them? So you can see on the left-hand side, this is the uh, term that we have, the transmission electron microscope. And on the right-hand side, we have a scanning electron microscope. These are the models that we have. Uh, we have a GOL TEM and a FEI ACM. So FEI is now uh, taken over by Thermo Fisher. So it's become Thermo Fisher. So what is important to note is that for a transmission electron microscope, as the name suggests, the electrons are transmitted through the specimen. So here you see the schematic here. Here you have the electron source of both these microscopes. You have the electron source, which is similar. You have this electron source, which is the source of electrons. And then the electrons are traveling through the column. This is the column of the microscope. And you have a specimen here. So for a TEM, electron beam is transmitted through the specimen, okay? And, and it, the, the electrons hit the fluorescent screen down here and you can see the image using your eye. Whereas in a SEM, it is completely different. So what happens here is the electrons are not transmitted through the specimen. What it happens is the electron beam interacts with the specimen. The specimen is here. The electron beam, the blue path that you see as the electron beam, it interacts with the specimen and as a result of this interaction, different signals are generated. Different electron signals are generated with different uh, different energies, low, low energy electrons, high, higher energy electrons. So these are all collected by various detectors. We'll discuss them in detail later. So we have different detectors for collecting these signals and the signals are processed in the computer and you can see the image on a monitor or a computer. You cannot see this image using your eye, nor can you use a camera like for a TEA, right? So on the extreme left-hand corner, you see this is a Dishmania parasite. This is a parasite which causes Dishmaniasis or Kalazar. So you can see on the left-hand side corner and on the right-hand side corner, these are the same parasites, but you can appreciate the difference of information that we get out of a TEM and a SEM. So here you can see, that as a result of the interaction, the beam, electron beam is transmitted through the specimen. So you basically uh, can see the internal structures of these cells here. So it's, it's much more detailed information that you get out of a TEM. Whereas for a ACM, you can only see the surface features, the topological features, right? Because the electrons are not transmitted through the specimen. So for a TEM, you are basically looking at very thin sections. You cannot have a very thick, uh, sample in a TEM because electron beams won't penetrate through the specimen. So typically, as Dr. Agarwal just uh, explained, so it has to be in, typically in the range of 40 to 80 nanometer and 100 nanometer thick specimen for which you need to sometimes uh, use an ultra microtome for ultra thin sectioning so, so as to obtain these very thin sections. So you need a very thin, thin specimen for TEM, right? And you get a 2D image 2D projection of the actual sample, so which is on the left-hand corner here. So for a ACM, the, you can see these are the same cells, but here 
you can just looking at the image, you should be able to make out whether this is a SEM image or a TEM image. For a TEM image, again, I repeat that you can see the internal structures as electrons are transmitted through the specimen. And for a SEM, it's only the topological features. Internal structures cannot be seen. Okay. So the uh, for a SEM, the beam scans the specimen and looks only at generated electrons. Okay. So electrons are then the processed image can be seen on the screen. It cannot be seen using the eye. Another major difference is that a scanning electron microscope does not have an objective lens, which is typically the heart of the microscope. For any microscope, the objective lens is the heart of the microscope. So here for a SEM, as we'll see later on, there is no objective lens as such. There are three condenser lenses, electromagnetic lenses. The third condenser is uh, often uh, inappropriately called as a as an objective lens, but it typically does not have any objective lens. So these are the main differences. We'll come to it slowly. So uh, going back to the history of microscopy, this is just a brief uh, recap. All of you are aware of it. Zacharias Janssen invented the light microscope around 1595. Magnification was three to nine times. It is, here is the, uh, the, the microscope that he invented. Then came Robert Hooke's compound microscope. Magnification improved to around 30 times. This was in the early 1600s, and this is how the microscope looked like. This is a light source. You had a flask of water, which acts as a condenser, and then you have a sample here. You are focusing knob, and this is the eyepiece. So this is how his microscope looked like, and it could magnify it. You could see cells in it, and his famous contribution is the book called Micrographia, where he described the objects and the objects that he saw using this microscope. Then Antony van Leeuwenhoek in the late 1600s developed a microscope which could magnify 270 times. Okay, and by the uh, 20th century, the light microscope was able to magnify about 1,000 times and could resolve uh, the resolution was like 0.2 micrometers. And the history of electron microscopy again, this was discussed by Dr. Agarwal, but just in brief, uh, in 1873, Abbe and Helmholtz they showed that the resolution. Uh, depends on the N lambda, the uh, wavelength of the energy source. And here was the theoretical promise of developing an electron microscope. The, the lower, the smaller the wavelength of your uh, light source, the energy source, the better the resolution. In 1897, Thomson describes existence of negatively charged particles, that's electrons. In 1924, Broglie theorized that electrons had wave-like characteristics. And in 26, Bush showed that the path of the electron could only be deflected by magnetic lenses in the same way light could be deflected by optical lenses. And in 1931, the first electron microscope was built in the University of Berlin by Ruska. And uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1986. So this was, this was the uh, 1931 in Germany, Hans Ruska here. And this was the first commercial TEM. The first uh, scanning electron microscopes came around 1930s and the prototype uh, was developed by Noll and von Ardin in Germany. But the resolution of this microscope was no better than a light microscope. So after several refinements by his work in from the RCL labs and Macmillan and Oatley from Cambridge in 1963, they could come up with a SEM, which could resolve like in the range of 20 to 50 nanometers. And the useful magnification was about 75,000 times and the depth of field, we'll come to what depth of field means, was 300 times that of a light microscope. This is what the first uh, commercial microscope in 1965, the Cambridge uh, Instrument Company came up with. So you could see that these are quite big, the electronics, and this was quite a big uh, equipment at that time. The modern ACMs look like this, and the resolution is two nanometers, and magnification is more than two million times. So these are different components of the uh, SEM. So the SEM is a much uh, uh, smaller uh, equipment than a TEM. The TEM column is quite quite tall, quite big, long. Here, in comparison, the SEM column is a little short. Like this is the electron column. And you have a chamber here. So here is a source of electrons. This cable, you see this cable here. This cable here, this is the electron gun the source. And this is the column through which the electrons travel. And this is the chamber where you put in the samples. And as a result of this interaction between the electrons and the samples, this is the stage here. You can move the stage in all three directions, X, Y, Z. And you have different detectors which collect the signals that are generated 
as a result of the interaction between the electrons and the specimen. And then there are several detectors. And this is the EDAX, which is a spectrometer, it's X-ray diffraction spectrometer. So we'll come to this later. So this is how the modern SEMS look like. And they're the best ones are able to resolve uh, objects up to two nanometers, right? So we need to remember that it's at least 10 times worse than a TEM. Okay, so what do we mean by useful magnification? Useful magnification is basically resolution of the human eye divided by the resolution of the lens system. The value that we get is the useful magnification. And beyond this value is called, it's called magnification is called empty magnification. That's, that means it won't give you any information. It will be useless basically. So for an optical microscope, useful magnification is 0.2 millimeters, which is the resolution of the human eye divided by 0.2 micrometers is the resolution of the SEM. Uh, sorry, for the light microscope. So this comes to around 1000 times. So useful magnification is 1000 for an optical microscope. Whereas for ICM, this is 0.2 millimeters divided by two nanometers, which is 100,000 times. So this is the difference. You can see the useful magnification is quite, quite good. Okay, this is the first uh, electron microscope that was built in the Asia Pacific region actually in India. And uh, this was constructed by Professor N. N. Dasgupta and his colleagues during 1946-48 at the Institute of Nuclear Physics. Now it's called the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics in Kolkata. And this was a horizontal microscope. This was a TEM basically, but it was a horizontal. Unlike uh, the microscope, the TEMs that you see now, which are all vertical, this, this column was uh, horizontal. So this is still kept uh, in, at the Institute and the magnification was 20,000 times and the high tension was 80 kV. And their group uh, used this microscope for the research and it's published several papers in the Nature Journal as well. So coming to magnification and resolution, these are two separate things. Magnification is a measure of the increase in the diameter of a structure. Like here you see, and you see the diameter is here, the diameter has increased. So it's basically, this is called, this is magnified, right? The measure, di diameter is increased. But what is resolution? It is the ability to discriminate two closely placed structures that might otherwise appear as one and to see more details within the object. So on the left-hand side, you see this is poorly resolved. That means these two objects cannot be seen as two separate objects. Right? If the resolution were better improved, this, this is, for example, is better resolved. Right? So higher magnification does not necessarily mean better resolution. This is a very important thing that you should keep in mind that just increasing the magnification does not necessarily mean better resolution, it does not give you any additional information. So resolution and magnification are terms which are not interchangeable. This is very important. And it's not, it is possible to enlarge an object without being able to see or resolve any detail. So that's, that's the difference, right? So both magnification and resolution are necessary to produce a good quality image. This is just a comparison of the three microscopes, the light microscope, the TEM and the ACM. So here, all of them, you can see that they have an illumination source. For a light microscope, it's a, it's a bulb. And here it's for a TEM and ACM is the, uh, the electron gun. That's a tungsten filament or it can be a lab six or a field emission gun. Then you have these condenser lenses, objective lenses for a, a TEM. You place a specimen here and you see an image here on the fluorescent screen here. So for a light microscope is the same thing, you use glass lenses. So you, again, you have these condenser lenses and objective lenses, and then you see the image using your eyepiece, your eye. With the TEM also, you can see your image using a stereo microscope or directly using your eye, looking at the fluorescent screen here. Or you can use CCD cameras even and get an image on the screen. But for a SEM, you see it's different. So here you have these three condenser, electromagnetic condenser lenses, C1, C2, C3, and you don't have any objective lens, okay? This is, uh, sometimes people refer to this lens as the objective lens, which is incorrect. This is inappropriate. This is a, this does not have any objective lens. So here, this is the path of the electrons and this is a specimen here. And as a result of this interaction, signals are generated, these signals, are collected by different detectors according to the signal and they're processed and you can see the image on the monitor. You cannot see it with your eye, okay? So this, this is the major difference. So again, uh, as a result of this interaction with the electron beam, which is a green colored uh, cone here, 
and you have a specimen here. So after this interaction, this is these are the different signals that you can get. So all the signals that are passed through the specimen, that is below the specimen, you have an elastically scattered electrons, transmitted electrons. So these are all transmitted, transmitted electrons. These are collect. This is trans stem information basically, and the, the signals that are reflected back from the surface. This is useful for scanning electron microscopy. So you can have secondary electrons. You can have X-rays, okay? You can have backscattered electrons. So secondary electrons are the most widely used uh, signal for biological scanning electron microscopy. They come from uh, more, more towards the surface of the specimen, whereas backscattered electrons come from a lot deeper within the sample. As a result of this interaction with this, uh, the electron beam and the specimen, you have something called a teardrop interaction volume. So it appears as a teardrop. We'll come to it later. So the thing is that all the signals that are coming above the specimen, okay, this is SEM information and the ones which below here transmitted, these are useful for, for TEM. So this is again a schematic of how the, the different components of a SEM. So this is electron source, these are your condenser lenses and the C3 is also the condenser lens, three is also called the final lens. So what happens is, as a result of this interaction, okay, the other important thing to note here is that, uh, I'm not sure whether you've had your confocal microscopy classes yet, but there, there is something called rastering. So here, the specimen, the beam is rastered, scanned over the specimen, line by line, like this. The electron beam moves like this, here left to right, then comes again, moves in the y direction, and again, moves across. So line by line, raster scanning over the specimen, which is similar to what a confocal in confocal microscopy, the laser beam is also rastered scanned over the specimen using galvo mirrors. So here it's a similar thing. Unlike in other microscopic techniques like in light microscope and, in, uh, and transmission electron microscopes, the electron beam is rastered scanned over the specimen. And as the signals are generated, they're collected by the detector and processed, and you can see the image on the monitor. So first line is scanned, you can see the first signal. Okay, second line, second signal. So after all this is scanned, then you see the composite image. Actually, this is very fast. So when you look at it, it will be all, uh, it will come at once in a single image. There is no delay, but this is how it is processed. Okay. And uh, so it's just like entering uh, a dark room with a torch light. So if you take a torch light and you start from uh, maybe point it at the wall from left to right, then from right to left. So this is how torch light can be compared with the electron beam. And uh, you are it's in your mind and then you reconstruct and you can see the image. So it's sim something like that. Okay, on the right hand side is uh, what is shown here is that the electrons uh, travel in a helical trajectory, it does not uh, travel in a straight line. Okay, so electrons in a magnetic field, these are electromagnetic lenses here. So in a TEM and an ACM, it moves in a, so this is the electromagnetic lens here. The electrons are moving in a helical trajectory and it sorts is at one point and it meets at one point, which is a focal point. Okay, so and typically all the laws of light are valid for uh, electron optics as well. Okay, so it behaves like a convex lens, convex glass lens. I think like electromagnetic lens can be compared with a convex glass lens and all the laws of light are valid for electron optics as well. Okay, so electrons doesn't, don't follow a straight line. I mean, it follows a helical trajectory. This is another thing that you might remember. Okay, so what are the advantages of a light microscope? So here you can see the resolution for a light microscope is 200 nanometers, whereas for a typical SEM, resolution is like two nanometers, typically like five nanometers. And, but the most important thing is the depth of field. What do we mean by depth of field? Depth of field is the height of the specimen that appears in focus in an image. So you can see this image, this is an incandescent bulb, the light bulb. And you can see the top one is a ACM image and the same, uh, sample, the same specimen, same bulb filament is from a light microscope. So you can see the lower one, you cannot focus on the, uh, the ones, the one which is away, the uh, point which is away, the focal points which are further away. Whereas in ACM, so all of it is in focus. So the depth 
that's the depth of field. So that's the height, entire height of the specimen appears in focus. So for a SEM, this is like 300 times that for a light microscope. So as a result of this, great topological uh, detail can be obtained even at very low magnifications and can provide much more information than a light microscope. So these are the different brands, the popular, most popular brands for scanning electron microscopes. We have one from Geol, this is from Zeiss, and this is Thermo Fisher. Okay, these are the most popular brands of scanning electron microscopes. Okay, the other thing is microanalysis is possible. We'll, we'll see how we can do this later. Okay, so we have covered the uh, same applications. We have discussed the difference between a TEM and a SEM. Now we'll come to the components of a SEM and their function. So these are the components. So we have an electron gun up here. So what it does basically is generates electron beam with selectable energy. Okay, so one thing again you need to know here is that as Dr. Agarwal was saying that uh, different KBs, like at SGPGI, you have a 120 kilovolt TM, right? So for a, so it can go up to like 200 KV, 300 KV. There are even uh, two or three million volt uh, TMs in the world, in Japan and in the US for special applications. But for anyway, I'm not going to do that, but for SEM, so you don't need such high KV. So approximately it'll be like 30 KV. Most of the biological specimens, you need to work at very low KVs, right? To get the proper information. Because as, as you increase the KV, as you go to higher and higher KVs, the electrons are much more energized. So these are very highly energetic electrons and they'll penetrate the specimen. So that is not something you want in an SEM. It could be bad, right? It's bad. So you, typically it is restricted to around 30 kilovolts. So that's good enough. So, and uh, basically work at lower KVs for best results in biological SEMs because we are only concerned with the surface features. We don't want signals coming from deep within the sample. We are concerned about the surface features. We are concerned about the secondary electron signals. So that's why we don't have high KV SEMs, unlike TEMs. So in TEMs, the electrons, you want the electrons to transmit through the specimen. You want very high energetically, very high electrons to transmit, to be able to transmit through thick specimens, comparatively thick, I mean, maybe uh, for a 120 kb or 100 nanometer thick section would be okay but for a 300 kb maybe you can work with a 200 nanometer uh, section okay so that's the purpose uh, with tems but here for acm you are only concerned with the secondary electrons which come from very close to the surface of the specimen so you don't want highly energetic electrons which will penetrate through the specimen okay so that's why we don't have the typically is around 30 kb so that's the electron gun and then you have your vacuum system. So you need vac a very good vacuum system so that the electrons can travel uh, through the column and interact with the specimen because you know that electrons can't travel in air. So, so you remove the air molecules that might impede the passage of these high energy electrons down the column and as well as to allow low energy secondary electrons to travel to the detector. So here that's the need of the vacuum system. So you need a very good vacuum system for electrons to travel through the column. Then you have your lens system. So what the lens system does is it produces a small focus spot of electrons within a small spatial volume. So with a very small angular spread. You don't want the electron beam to spread around too much. So you want a very focused uh, uh, spot of electrons within a very small spatial volume. And the lens system here comprises of three lenses, basically condenser lens one, condenser lens two, and you have your condenser lens three here. This is called the final lens. It's also called the final lens, which is the most important lens of the scanning electron microscope. And that is why sometimes it is inappropriately called as the objective lens, which, is, which it is not. So these lenses are all electromagnetic lenses, okay? Then you have a scan deflection system built into the uh, condenser lenses. So what the scan deflection system does is basically moves the electron beam uh, if you remember, we just talked about it, that the electron beam has to move in a raster, raster pattern over the specimen area. So the scan, scan deflection system, there are deflection coils here, so which we help the electron beam to deflect from left to right and right to left. Okay, so that's the scan deflection system here. And then you have a specimen stage here. So specimen stage is where you place your specimen and this stage can be moved in all directions, okay, X, Y, Z. And even you can rotate the stage. 
then you have the detection unit. So what the detection unit basically collects these signals after the beam specimen interaction and these uh, systems pick up the signals and converts them into amplified electrical signal which is sent to the PC and displayed on the monitor as we talked about. Okay, so coming to each component now, the electron gun, it's similar to that of a TEM, so I won't be discussing it in too much detail. So basically, this is a tungsten gun, which comprises of a filament, a Vennel cylinder, this is the Vennel, and you have an anode here. So this typically is called the self-biased gun or a triode gun. So typically by thermionic emission, there's a tungsten filament here, it's a hairpin tungsten filament, and this is heated temperatures around 2700 degrees centigrade. And by applying a high positive potential difference between the filament and the anode, you can thermally excite these electrons. And these are which travel at very high speeds through the anode. There's an aperture here in the anode. Aperture is basically a hole through the anode and the electrons travel through this uh, anode here. So basically it acts as a convex lens here. These are types of electron guns. So these are similar. The gun is similar for both TEM and ACM again. This is a heated tungsten. So this is made of uh, the metal tungsten and it works in the same way as an incandescent light bulb works. And uh, basically by thermionic emission, uh, you get these accelerated electrons. And uh, you have the second kind, which is uh, lab six, lanthanum hexaboride. This is also a thermal filament where the work function is lower than for a tungsten. So that's, it's more efficient. Work function meaning that with the lower energy, you can extract more electrons out of it. So, but better vacuum is needed for lab six and it, it's a little more expensive than a tungsten filament. And the third kind is the most sophisticated kind of electron gun that there is. It's called the field emission gun, it's a FEG. So this is not a thermal filament. The electrons are not emitted uh, by thermionic emission. Here, these are electrons are expelled by applying a very power electric field very close to the tip of the filament. And the result is a very coherent beam of electrons. It's around 500 times brighter than a tungsten filament. And again, it's very difficult to maintain and very expensive. So for ideally for cryo EM, so you'll see that uh, for cryo EM, invariably you have a FEG source, okay? Okay, so here, what I'm trying to say here is that lenses, these are the electromagnetic lenses I can just discussed earlier. And uh, this uh, it's given, the focal length is given by this equation. F is equal to K V by I square. So it's basically inversely proportional to the square of the current that is passing through the lens coil. So typically, as you can see from this equation, simply by changing the, the lens current, you can change the focal length. That's a very useful thing to have uh, in an electron microscope. Like, so you can change the focal length just by varying the lens current. So unlike, uh, in a light microscope to focus or magnify. For magnification, you have different objective lenses in the nose piece. Like maybe typically you have six objective lenses, 5X, 10X, 40X, 60X, 100X. So you need to change, switch between the objective lenses. And then again, to focus, you need to work on the working distance. So you need to bring it closer, okay? So as you increase the objective lens power for 100X, Objective, you need to work at very close to the lens, right? And for a 5X, maybe it would be further away. But in an electron microscope, the advantage is simply by changing the lens current, you can move, do all these things. You can focus and magnify, magnify without physically moving the sample or moving the lens. This is so, this is very useful. You don't have to move the, change the lenses or you don't have to move your sample to focus and magnify. Okay, coming back to uh, the condenser lenses, you, as I said earlier, we have three condenser lenses. So first two are used for demagnification of the spot size. Spot size is basically the spot of electrons. Okay, so as I said, if you remember, it has to have a very uh, small angular spread and located within a very small spatial volume. And that, so that's the kind of spot size that you want. So first two condenser lenses deal with the size of the demagnification of the spot size. And the CL3 as a final condenser is used for the final demagnification of the focal spot to fine tune the spot size without the loss of beam electrons. So this is inappropriately called as the objective lens, which is the strongest lens in the SEM and the most important one. That's why it's called the objective lens, but it's, it's, not, it's not correct actually. And uh, so the CL3 also has the condenser lens three also has sets of deflection coils and stigmators. Stigmators are something, uh, that compensates for 
an aberration called astigmatism. Okay, we'll come to it later. So these deflection coils are connected to the scan generator. So this helps in raster scanning the electron spot over the beam. And in ACM, the magnification is basically the length displayed on the screen divided by the length scanned on the specimen. So typically, this is that if the length of the object you're looking at on the screen, if you use a ruler and you see it's 10 centimeters, and the length that is scanned on the specimen inside your chamber is 10 millimeters. So the magnification will be 10 times. So it's as simple as that. Okay. So it's a length displayed on the screen divided by the length scanned on the specimen. So the length scanned on the specimen is on a much smaller scale, like 10 millimeter. And if the length on the screen is 10 centimeter, the magnification will be 10 times. So it's like that. Okay. So comparison of electron beam spots focused on the specimen. So this is the kind of A is the spot, kind of spot that you, that you would like to have. It's a symmetrical spot. There is no astigmatism. So astigmatism is, a, uh, is an aberration that results from uh, unequal uh, magnetic fields. So you can compensate this uh, using stigmators, which are basically the six to eight small pieces of electromagnetic coils which are placed inside the bore of the condenser lens three. So this is called a stigmator for obtaining a good image in an ACM, especially at very high magnifications and high resolutions, you need to correct for astigmatism. This is a very common aberration and common problem. Unless you use proper stigmation, you won't get a good image. So, so the B is the kind of spots, spot uh, that, is, that you get for a um, astigmatic condition. It's an asymmetrical spot, right? So we need to compensate this using uh, stigmators. Okay, the other th important thing is so uh, we have apertures here for both for TEMs and ACMs. You have lots of apertures, condenser lens apertures, and for uh, TEM you have objective apertures. So apertures play a very important role in ACM as well. Apertures are placed inside the lenses and helps to decrease the spot size and to reduce the spherical aberration by excluding the peripheral electrons. And it can also be used to control the depth of field in the specimen. Right here, you can see that aperture is wide, it's a wide aperture here. And if you close this aperture, this is a smaller aperture, you can increase the depth of field, which is the height of uh, the height of the sample that you can have in focus, which is something you want. So by decreasing the size of the aperture, you can get this. Also, by increasing the working distance, you can achieve this. Okay. So this is the semi-angular aperture. This is the alpha here. So you can reduce this. So resolution in the SEM depends totally on the spot size. So smaller the spot size, better the resolution typically. The final lens is used for focusing the size of the illuminating beam spot to match the magnifications that are used. So that's why it's the most important lens, the final lens or the condenser lens three. And this is responsible for the final spot size that you get on the specimen level. So you can see here as a spot diameter, this is one nanometer, 100 nanometer, 500 nanometer. As the spot size increases, the resolution decreases. So this is from best to worst and signal is weak to strong. Okay, you get the stronger signal, but bad resolution. So this, you have to play around with the parameters to get the best results. But the important thing is that the spot size will determine the resolution of the ACM. So these are the lens aberrations that you have typically with any microscope. You have spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, and astigmatism. So uh, spherical aberrations are basically results from lens imperfections. So you have different focal lens in the center and the edges of the lens typically. So this is so here is uh, where the apertures come in place. You can cut off the peripheral uh, electrons by using proper apertures. A chromatic this is basically due to blurring, due to different energy spreads in the electron beam and current fluctuations, you have chromatic aberrations. And astigmatism is a lens defect caused by magnetic lens asymmetry. So this is corrected by stigmators. Okay. okay, so now coming to detectors. So these are the detectors which uh, are responsible for collecting the signals that are generated as a result of the interaction with the specimen. So you can have, this is a secondary electron detector. You have a backscattered electron detector. Okay, so different manufacturers have different names for these detectors. So the most commonly used detector is the 
uh, Everhart only detector or the secondary electron detector. So this detector is for is, is used for collecting the secondary electrons generated as a result of the interaction. So you have, uh, as you can see here, you have backscattered electrons. These are for collecting the backscattered signals. You have large field, there are different names, large field detector, gaseous secondary electron detector. EDS detector is basically for X-ray, X-ray signals. You want to do elemental analysis. This is for energy dispersive spectroscopy. So you have a special uh, spectrometer for collecting these signals and for performing elemental analysis. Okay, so these are the different detectors. This is a final lens, condenser lens. Final lens is here, and this is your. These are where the detectors are placed. This is typically the uh, secondary electron detector, which is the most widely used one here on the left. And then you have these several detectors here according to your applications. I won't go into too much detail of this. This is the wide, most widely used detector. Is that this is the Everhart Thonley detector. And as you can see, this is your beam electrons coming here. And you have your, this is your final lens. This is a pole piece. This is the final lens, the condenser lens three. And here is your specimen. As a result of this interaction, you have these signals. You have backscattered electrons, which are going to this detector. You have a backscattered electron detector here. Then you have your secondary electrons for which you have a dedicated secondary electron detector. And these are guided down the PMTs and photocathode and photomultiplier tube and they are processed and you can see your image on the screen here. So this is how the detectors work like and their locations around the, um, in the specimen chamber. And again, uh, you need a very good vacuum system. As I said, typically you have turbo molecular pumps, which are typically the kind of uh, things it can be compared with like a, the engine of a jet, uh, jet engine. So this is a turbo molecular pump and you have rotary pumps in ACMs as well. And these are the vacuum levels in the microscope for typically uh, for field emission guns, you need ultra high vacuum, okay? Like 10 to the power minus seven pascals is what you're looking at. But for tungsten filaments, it serves for most applications, useful for most applications, low cost and uh, vacuum levels are not that demanding. Okay, so it depends on the application. Uh, how you would like to configure your ACM. So typically uh, the cost of an ACM would, tungsten uh, filament ACM would be like around one, one crore. And for a typically for a fake SEM, uh, it could go up to like uh, five crores. And then if you have uh, other things in built into it, it can go up to 10 crores even. Okay, 10 crores and above. So it's a very wide range of hardware that uh, options that you have depending on the applications. Okay, now, so we are coming to the teardrop uh, volume interaction that I was talking about earlier. I hope I'm not going too fast uh, due to the time limitation. Probably I'm going a little too fast. I hope it's, I mean, you're uh, getting what I'm trying to say. Okay, so here is your primary beam, and this is, this is the interaction that you're having with your specimen. This is a specimen here, okay? And uh, you can have different signals. So from the near the surface of the specimen, this is your secondary electrons. More deeper inside the sample, this is the interaction volume, okay? The electrons are interacting with your specimen. So closer to the surface is electron, uh, secondary electrons. Deeper, from deeper inside, you have backscattered electrons. And you have Auger electrons, other electrons and all that important. The red one, this is the most important signal here. But you can have other signals for which you can have dedicated for X-rays. As I said, you have EDS, which is energy dispersive spectrometer for elemental analysis, right? But the most widely used one for you at least, I mean, will be secondary electrons. This is the one which you would be interested in. Okay, so as a result of this interaction with the beam and the specimen, you have different kinds of scattering. You have inelastic scattering where the electron beam loses some energy. So these are very low energy electrons, like typically uh, zero to 50 electron volts. And this is commonly used to generate the 3D image. Okay, and these come from closer to the surface of the specimen. And the second kind is the elastic scattering where the electrons are based, typically the source beam electrons, which uh, has which have just changed direction without losing any energy. Okay, so this typically happens when it, electrons collide with a heavy nuclei, a heavy atomic nuclei. So this is uh, when you have these black scattered electrons. And third kind is 
when you have, uh, as a result of the interaction with the electron beam, the inner shell electrons are ejected and the outer orbital comes in to fill, outer orbital electrons fill the inner void, some energy is released. So that is the X-rays. So this is, for this you need a X-ray uh, diffract uh, spectroscope spectrometer. This is used for elemental analysis, but rarely used in biological SEM. So for the three types of signals, secondary electrons, you get topographic information. This is important, right? So you have topographic information from secondary electrons, and these come from area which is very close to the surface, typically like 10 nanometer depth of the sample, and these are low energy electrons. Then you have backscattered electrons, which, which are basically composition information, okay? These are coming from inside the space, sample, and these are higher energy electrons. And third kind is X-ray, and which gives you elemental information. Okay, so you can study surface topography of objects, you can study the surface morphology, you can do elemental analysis, and you can do morphochemical analysis. These are some of the possibilities using SEM. Now we come to the specimen preparation techniques, right? So general requirement for uh, sample preparation is to end up with an object that has the same shape and surface properties as a living state, but devoid of fluid uh, for observing the specimen under vacuum. So typically in ACM under high vacuum, you can't have water inside it, hydrated samples, so you need to have a dry. But obviously it's possible to also observe hydrated samples in the native states using something called cryo ACM. So under cryo conditions that can be done, but typically for normal conventional applications, you want to just end up with the same shape and surface feature. Not, so here the specimen preparation is not as demanding as TEM because there in TEM you have to preserve the internal structures also. But here, just preserving the surface features will, will serve the purpose. It must be conductive. So you can't have static charging there and it must be vacuum compatible. And results also depend on material properties, like beam sensitivity, hardness, softness of the material, and uh, all these things will finally determine the image, uh, image uh, quality. So typically working in an EM lab, this goes for both TEM and SEM. You need dust-free environment, you need a very controlled control environment, temperature, humidity, uh, all these things, stable uh, electric supply, vibration free. Okay, these are things that have to be, before installing an equipment, these things have to be kept in mind. And careful handling of EM chemicals. Most of the chemicals used in electron microscopy are very toxic and carcinogenic. So typically fume hoods are used, gloves safety measures should be used. And if you're working with infectious samples, uh, biosafety norms have to be followed. And routine monitoring and maintenance of equipment is also very important. Okay, so typically this is uh, the flow of uh, how things work for, a spe for specimen preparation for ACM. If you're working with a powder sample, like for formulations, dry formulations or APIs like, like we do sometimes, you just simply take the powder, do a, a sputter coating that is coating with the conductive metal and go ahead with the uh, uh, observe under the microscope. But typically for biological SEM, if you're working with cells, tissues and things like that, you have to follow an elaborate method, which is again, not as demanding as a TEM because here you only want to uh, preserve the surface uh, features of your specimen. So you acquire your specimen, you do your trimming, then you fix. Fixation is always similar to that of TEM. Dehydration, till here it's the same. Then here what you do is, a special step comes in here for drying. So for drying, you have to follow a special procedure called a CPD or a critical point drying. So here, this uh, step is done to avoid the surface tension effects. If you perform normal air drying, this, the surface due to surface tension effects, the the specimen, the cells of the tissue will shrink, right? It'll be dehydrated and it'll shrink, but that is not something you want. You're interested in the surface features and if it is shrunken, then it won't give you the information you're looking for. So there is a special procedure, it's called the CPD or the critical point drying method. And after this, you have to make the uh, specimen conductive, okay? So for that, you have to have a metal coating, typically with gold, gold palladium, as it's an instrument called a sputter coater, and then you examine your specimen. So I'm not, uh, due to lack of time, I won't uh, go into the details because I'm running short, short of time, I think. So fixation, then commonly used fixate is a glutaldehyde, formaldehyde, mixture of both, and then you have a secondary fixation. You have you can have osmium tetroxide there. I won't go into the buffering system. Maybe you can skip all this. So critical point drying is uh, what happens is you want to have so there is no apparent difference between the liquid and the gaseous state of the medium. The surface tension here is reduced to zero 
and this uh, occurs at a specific temperature and pressure with the resulting density known as a critical point. So this condition of zero surface tension can be used to dry biological specimens for delicate specimens and you can avoid the damaging effects of surface tension. So typically this is done with uh, carbon dioxide, but like we are concerned mainly with the removal of water, right? But water critical point is 374 degrees and 3000 PSI. So you can't heat your specimen to such temperature, it'll destroy your specimen. So typically we use something called the CO2 carbon dioxide, which has a critical point of 31 degrees and 1000 PSI. Okay, and this is, uh, uh, there is something called, this is the, let's, let's not go into the details of this. So, so what you need to know is, you need to use an instrument called a critical point dryer to perform this. And then after you do this, you have to make your samples conductive. So, so as to avoid this charging effect. So you have a sputter coater. So solution is to coat your specimen with a thin layer of gold. Okay. So the idea is to increase the electrical conductivity of the sample so that you can don't have charging effects. So this is how the sputter coater looks like. And this is a critical point dryer. And typically you coat with gold or gold palladium. And these are stubs on which the samples are kept. You can, so here for ACM, you don't need very thin samples. You can place, uh, place uh, specimens uh, the size of a brick even. So that can go inside this, uh, depending on the size of the sample chamber, a specimen chamber you can use. But these are the stubs on which you place your specimen. And these are conductive tabs. And you can also have uh, the chamber, you can you have a CCD camera and these are the detectors. This is a stage. You can place up to seven samples set in, on the stage here. And let's skip all this. Uh, how much time do I have? I think I have five, ten minutes. Okay, so imaging conditions and parameters again, uh, while imaging, you have uh, to keep in mind these things. The operation mode, the high voltage, the detector type, the working distance, magnification, correct focus, the spot size, the astigmatism. So there are several things that you have to keep in mind while uh, operating the instrument and acquiring an image. And then there are these vacuum modes. So our high vacuum mode is good for conductive samples. Okay, but most biological samples are non-conductive, right? So you have to use low vac for mixed. So there are different modes, right? For wet samples, for hydrated samples, you have cryosem. High, so low voltage is typically used for surface imaging and beam sensitive samples high voltage for conductive samples. Okay, so these are things that maybe, um, I'll skip all the imaging problems. There are several problems that one comes across, like lack of sharpness, low image quality noises, image distortion and deformation. So which like, for example, here, if you, the effect of accelerating voltage, here you can see for a lower KV on the right-hand side, five KV, you can see much more details of your specimen. Whereas a 30 KV, higher KV, you cannot see the surface features here, right? So you can get high resolution at, okay, so at higher KVs, but uh, very unclear surface features, more edge effect, more problems, okay. So again, here is the same thing, 5 KV gives you more, much more detail. Okay. And this is what is charge up. If you have a charge up, you have a unequal brightness and contrast in your specimen image. This is beam damage. Sometimes you have electron beam. If you have overexposed, you get destroy the sample. Okay, and this is astigmatism. So astigmatic images, you can just look at it and identify because these are uh, smeared in one direction here. So you have to stigmate so that you get proper uh, corrected astigmatic features. And this is what you have, what happens if you don't do a CPT here, you see the drying effect due to surface tension, it's all dried up. So you get destroyed your the surface features of the specimen. And this is the one below is the CPD one. Okay, so some publications from our lab. So here is one, this is with Leishman. You can see the, um, monitor the changes in the morphology of your parasite on treating with the compound, the mode of action of drugs can be worked out. Okay, and these are some formulations, some inhalable microparticles which are loaded with antitubercular drugs. You can load drugs in these microparticles. And so for characterization of these drug delivery systems, we use uh, ACM quite extensively. And these are developing one of the projects where we were developing a novel peptide biomaterial for fracture healing as well as with microbial properties. So here you can see the microbial uh, surf, the back E. coli surface, which, uh, surface damage in the on the cell surface here. So these things can be 
uh, uh, worked out, the mode of action of these peptides could be worked out using SEM. Here again, okay. So these are some um, lung cancer cells where we were studying the effect of solanin on uh, these cells here. This is these are ovarian cancer cells and these are apoptotic cells. You can see they have rounded up and you have seen this blebbing here on these cells here. This is the one on the left is typically an untreated one. Okay, and this was one of the projects where we were repurposing this antifungal drug natamycin for leishmaniasis and you could see the surface features here. You can see surface damage on the membrane, cell membrane. Here again, you see this damage. And these are, this is for contraceptives where we're trying to work out the, the mode of action of these contraceptives, whether it was surfactant in nature or not. And these are nets, these are neutroph human neutrophils, and th these are uh, neutrophilar extracellular traps that we were uh, studying using scanning electron microscopy. And these probably are more relevant to you, that these are the biomedical applications. You can see that scanning electron microscopy, if you're interested, you can have a look at these papers if you want. So in um, diagnostic pathology and cell biology, these publications are for bone, for uh, bone tissue. Here you have poly for polycystic liver disease. And then you have this in nephropathy, and then you have uh, for pathology and SARS identification in different human tissues of uh, human tissues by SEM and TEM, and gastroenterology and uh, this uh, implants, facial implants in plastic surgery. Okay, so these are. Uh, Papers, if you're interested, you can go through them. They which have used uh, scanning electron microscopy in some detail here in bone orthopedics and things like that. So finally, I would just like to spend, uh, spend one or two slides on this. This is so this is a the cutting edge uh, technology, the cutting edge, the most advanced uh, cutting edge um, thing that is happening in electron microscopy is cryo-electron microscopy for which these three uh, gentlemen were awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 2017. So this was for developing cryo-EM for high-resolution structure determination of biomolecules. Okay, so this is Jacques Dubochet, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson. So cryo-EM was uh, appeared, in this, appeared in the Nature Methods paper in the 2015, where it was called the method of the year. So what you can see here is earlier, before 2013, the structures, cryo-EM was used to solve structures of proteins, or organelles, so the resolution was poor, but now the kind of technology, the hardware advancement is possible to get to really high resolution, like maybe two angstrom, less than two angstroms even, where you can trace the polypeptide chain even. So you can see the number increasing, and this paper here in which appeared in science is the cryovium structure of the COVID-19, uh, uh, 2019 COVID spike in the pre-fusion confirmation. And like you have an X-ray crystallography where whenever the structure is solved using X-rays crystallography, it's deposited in something called a PDB or the protein database bank. So here for electron microscopy, again, we have a similar thing. We have a EMDB, which is the electron microscopy data bank. If you're interested, you can go to this website and you can look at all the structures that were published. They have all the details and everything there. So the final resolution of this was three angstrom. So you can see how things are moving. Okay, so for ACM, this these two techniques I just wanted to mention. One is serial block phase ACM. Okay, so this is basically an automated technique for obtaining serial block phase images and reconstructing the data. So, using an ACM, you can achieve the images like TEM, right? So here you use something. You have a microtome, the ultra microtome built inside the chamber of the microscope, and you can using a backscattered electron detector. Uh, which results in a tem like image, you can process all the slices and then you can get volumetric information. So this is called technique, a very recent technique called serial block phase. So where you can work out the entire volume of the tissue, especially useful for nervous tissues, okay, so nervous tissues of the nervous system. And you can also use cryofib along with this. We have a focused ion beam. So what it does is basically perform the same function as a ultra microtome. It, you, using a focused ion beam, you can Maybe I can show you a video, uh, just a minute or two of the video. So this is so this is a technique called SBF or cryo FIB ACM, and this technique is this is a very useful technique called correlative light and scanning electron microscope. What you can do using this technique, it's also called CLEM. So you can use a cryo holder and the same cells. You can look at it using a fluorescent microscope and just uh, transfer this cartridge to a uh, cryo ACM and 
get data out of it and do a volumetric analysis. So basically you can look at the same specimen. This is the ACM image of the same cells of the same area and you can use fluorescently labeled, uh, I mean, whatever protein of interest you are, you can label them and you can get fluorescent images of the same cells, okay? So you have this whole system built in, in one system. Like you have electron, the ACM, and then you have your uh, ion milling. This is for sectioning. And then you have your fluorescence image. So this is called correlative light electron microscopy. So this is also again a technique which is coming up very nicely. Okay, I'm about to finish. These are the reference books. If you're interested, you can have a look at these books here. I mean, go through them if you're, you want to uh, study, I mean, get into more detail. If I have time, I can just uh, show you a video of the uh, serial block phase ACM that I was talking about. Okay, I hope you can see the screen. So this is the, just have a look at this video here. So this is what happens in a um, uh, SBF ACM. So this, this is, okay. So here inside the chamber, you have this. This is your sample. This is your sample. Hello, you can, you can see it, I hope. No, no, sir, we are not able to see this. Oh, but you're not able to see it? No, the video is not running. Okay, just a second. I'll just try to. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here, uh, this is the uh, the ACM here, and this is the chamber here. Okay, it stays three views. Inside the chamber, you have your specimen here. This is where the specimen holder is your specimen. Okay, it's kind of a resin block. And then you have your ultra microtome, the knife that you have sectioning, right? And then this block surface is imaged. Okay, this is electron beam here, and it's raster scanning, and you get an image. So like this, different depths of the specimen is like you shave off one layer, again, you get this signal here. Okay, so like that, you collect all the signals here. So increasing depths of the specimen, you collect it, collect all the signals, right? So then you combine all of them, you combine all of them, and then you reconstruct the volume. Okay, so so you combine all of them like you do in a CT's typical CT scan like thing. And then you can look at the volumetric data. So this is a dendritic cell. So you can work out, you can see all the details inside the cell. This is, this is possible. So this you can do, this is mouse extraocular muscle with a reconstructed peripheral nerve. So you can reconstruct using this technique. So this is a very recent technique, very expensive, but it's very useful. But again, it has limited applications, but it's very good for uh, the CNS and the tissues of the nervous uh, system. So here you can get them like data using this technique here. So some of the manufacturers have stopped uh, making uh, temps now. I mean, looking at you have Zeiss has stopped making temps. They have dedicated a lot of their investments and energies into uh, ACM here. Anyways, I don't think we'll have enough time for all that, but um, I hope uh, this was useful. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.